This morning in West Roxbury, protesters turned out for the resumption of street work on a natural gas pipeline under construction by Spectra Energy. Based on Texas, Spectra is also the parent of a company whose pipeline exploded on Friday in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. One of the people who fled that explosion is reportedly in critical condition. Joining us are two members of Resist the Pipeline in West Roxbury, Paul Horn, and a member who's also a professor at Boston University's Department of Earth and Environment, Nathan Phillips. Uh, thank you both very much for being with us. I want to start with uh, Paul. Uh, talk about what got you involved in this to begin with. Well, it was in the late fall of 2014 that I first learned about this project, as did many people in West Roxbury, and we were all stunned to learn that something of this magnitude was even in planning. Turned out that uh, it had been planned uh, sort of under the radar, beneath the radar, so to speak, during a transition between the Menino and Walsh administrations, and that so-called community hearings uh, were held at uh, inconvenient times during the Republican primaries, for example, on the day before school opened in Boston. So it hadn't yet attracted much attention. And one of the first people to call our attention to it and sound the alarm about the folly and the danger of the project was a local gas safety expert, a gentleman named Mark McDonald, who has worked for years in the industry, continues to do so, is no enemy of natural gas per se, but he pointed out the lunacy, the sheer danger in locating a pipeline through a densely settled urban neighborhood, Dedham in Boston, West Roxbury, and particularly across from the blasting at an active quarry, West Roxbury Sand and Gravel. So as we all learn more about this, we said, well, this can't stand. We've got to see what we can do about this. Nathan, uh, for every explosion that actually happens, there are many more pipelines and many more pipelines with leaks. So uh, why is this new pipeline so unusual? Is there anything particularly hazardous about it? It's many times more high, pre it's higher pressure by far than the pipes that go under our streets and sidewalks. So it's 750, it would be 750 pounds per square inch. The pipelines that go under our streets and sidewalks are about half a pound per square inch. So it's a wholly different kind of pipeline. This is a pipeline, Chris, that is typically uh, located in rural or very secluded areas, and probably not unlike the one in Pennsylvania that exploded, uh, but certainly not in densely settled urban neighborhoods like this. And this is, as I say, one of the, the key issue that galvanized the community immediately, particularly on the basis of what a gas safety consultant, a knowledgeable expert, had told us about this. Well, Nathan, I mean, there have been these assurances from Spectre that this is far enough underground, the, the pipeline is thick enough to withstand all kinds of stress, so uh, uh, why couldn't that be the case? Well, the explosion on Friday shows that these kinds of incidents do happen. And over the last decade, Spectra is averaging about two and a half incidents, uh, safety failures per year. So it is a situation, I call it black, a black swan type of event. It's low probability, but high impact if it happens. And these things are happening. Right. Paul, what, what's the alternative? Because uh, if, you, if you don't have natural gas uh, being piped around. I mean, there, there are other kinds of energy, but some of them have risks and, and some of them might even be worse as far as the effect on the environment. Well, I know Nathan has some thoughts about this, having studied the enormous loss of gas in the current system and how, if I recall correctly, the amount of gas loss for which you and I are paying as ratepayers, even though the gas is lost, uh, could heat up to 250,000 homes a year. So that's one strategy. Another is to rely more on renewables. And of course, I know that we couldn't convert tomorrow to renewables, no one's, no one's saying that. We've got better demand management software available so that during peak demand times, during the coldest days of winter, as we had last year, we can control the amount of gas. This is not a, an investment in infrastructure. This is not an investment we should be making in 50-year infrastructure at a time when we're moving away, need to move away from our reliance on fossil fuels. Natural gas is, let's remember, a fossil fuel and in many ways more dangerous than coal or uh, oil uh, with its meth high methane content, radioactive toxic methane content. Uh, the public certainly has been hearing conflicting stories about this need for gas. Uh, the, the Attorney General commissioned a study you're probably aware of that showed that we do not need more investment in these pipelines. And that Governor we have Patrick other strategies. had one that more or less said, well, well maybe we yeah. should have it for well, a while. Well, yeah. studies are uh, turning up different things. We really ought to air this out, but the, our governor doesn't seem to be listening to this. 
And neither of our two senators, unfortunately, and surprisingly, have not really paid as much attention to this, Senator Warren or Senator Markey, as we would like. It turns out a lot of this gas is actually headed for export, not to serve local needs as the industry continues to maintain. And for most people leading their lives on a daily basis, this uh, doesn't, you know, they don't have time to study these issues very deeply. Nathan, well, what about the effect? Because e e even if this is largely a gas that's being exported, uh, couldn't it be supplanting coal or oil uh, so that maybe there might be uh, less damage to the environment? Well, I think we're at a real uh, crossroads right now where we have to make the decisions about our energy future. And these pipelines are decades long commitments to a fossil fuel that if we build them out are not going to allow us to achieve our 2050 greenhouse gas reduction goals or even intermediate goals. Uh, we have to be looking and moving aggressively to offshore wind, solar, and the renewable energy that we need. Um, and we managed actually just fine in our record-breaking snow of 2014-15. And in, if you recall, the record cold uh, uh, Valentine's Day weekend that we had just a couple months ago, uh, we managed fine. So this uh, contention that our demand is always increasing is not borne out by the facts. What about the leaks, especially around uh, the Boston area, or at least in Massachusetts? What have, what have you found about the scale of that? We estimate with colleagues in a study that we published in 2015, colleagues from Harvard, Duke University, and Stanford, that the leak rate is about 3% of the delivered gas through to the Commonwealth. That amounts to about 10% of our state's greenhouse gas emissions inventory. If you take and save that gas along with do the kinds of efficiency and demand management uh, measures that Paul mentioned, these are things that together can help us meet the, the efficiency uh, that allows us not to depend on new gas uh, infrastructure. Paul, what about uh, the, the odds of being able to change the course of things here? Because I understand that there is going to be a day in court, but by the time that takes place, if, if the lawyers don't drag it out even more, this pipeline is going to be a lot more built. Might even be completed. Who knows? Well, uh, we don't know, but we got to keep fighting. You're, you're right. The both the city of Boston and the town of Dedham separately have filed lawsuits challenging FERC's Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's approval of this project. And you're right, that won't be heard probably until late this summer, perhaps early fall. Meanwhile, Spectra is proceeding technically at its own risk. But meanwhile, we have to continue the fight, including civil peaceful civil disobedience. Uh, you recall, Chris, that because uh, I know you've been in Boston long enough to recall this, that back in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a proposal to build a new highway that would have slashed through several neighborhoods, Brookline, Fenway, uh, Somerville, Cambridge, uh, the so-called inner belt. Neighborhoods, long before they could communicate with fax machines, let alone cell phones, got together and put together opposition to that successfully so that today we enjoy rapid transit with the Orange Line and Southwest Corridor Park and neighborhoods that are stronger as a result of that decision. So our hope is that we can continue this fight and somehow, some way, get them to stop and wake up to this insanity. Uh, one more question, Nathan, it's about the economics of, of pipelines. And it's one thing for a company in another state to, to build this new pipeline, uh, presumably to expand its market, but you, you've got the pipelines that are already here, the market's not expanding, and I can imagine a locally based uh, utility saying to consumers, we'll fix it, but you're going to have to pay for that. Well, right now the incentives are, we are paying for the lost gas. And there's a bill working through the house, uh, through the state house right now, to actually shift the incentive over so that the gas companies pay for the lost and unaccounted for gas. So that's one of the first things that needs to be done to shift and provide incentive to the utilities to fix the uh, leaks. All right. Well, thank you both very much, Paul Horn and Nathan Phillips. And we'll have more news in just a moment.